Well, I think uh, from my point of view, uh, I started in 2006. Uh, that was a short while after uh, London won the bid um, and uh, preceded uh, Annie's contribution. But my initial role was to uh, provide expertise uh, on behalf of CAVE, CAVE Space. Uh, and I was focusing particularly on some of the research and background to developing the thinking for the park. So it was an early sort of uh, scene setting exercise in many ways. Uh, and uh, in addition to my role was to involve a range of enablers from the Cape Space Enabling Panel, uh, not only Annie, um, but also uh, the likes of Jeremy, Jeremy Purseglove, David Lambert, um, uh, Tony Leach. We had a, a range of different enablers contributing to setting up some of the uh, research background and some of the technical elements for the project. Uh, and Arthur Galling as well helped Arthur, me out on the soils. Um, and Stuart Wilson was helping on procurement uh, and some of the soft work and contracting side. Stuart was involved in the project almost from the beginning with myself and still is involved. Yeah. Well my involvement, um, the initial contact was a phone call in um, I think July 2007 from John Hopkins and Peter had obviously been working closely with John and um, uh, I was one of Peter's Cave Space enablers and they were inviting me to see if I'd be interested in helping um, write the brief. So that was my first um, contact and I actually had four different um, roles within the, within the park. Um, so that was writing the, the brief for the parklands and public realm. Um, I then was also involved um, in the selection of the landscape architects, so I sat on the, um, the selection panel for the landscape architects. Um, and I then um, played a, a smaller role in, um, in Broxbourne, in the canoe slalom, because again, the ODA wanted to bring in um, some more landscape expertise, so I was involved in um, writing the brief there and helping procure um, that expertise. And um, Finally, um, so I, I didn't really have much involvement then, sort of during design and construction, and then I was invited onto the Legacy Learning Steering Group in 2011, and that was then really, rep well it, it was representing the Landscape Institute there on that steering committee with um, ODA, with Peter again, and with people like Natural England. Yeah, I would say probably continuing on also having uh, helped shape some of the thinking, developed the design brief, and from my side contributed to the design development in the early stages. Uh, then our paths crossed again on the learning legacy and so when I was working uh, in 2011 up to 2012 capturing uh, the final lessons, doing some of the interpretation uh, on uh, for visitors for the park. So I had to proofread his case study. <laughs> yeah, did a good job. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, when uh, the ODA started uh, developing its thinking uh, and starting to shape some of the background for the design brief, uh, we undertook some research work into uh, two areas, past presidents of Olympic parks and also some of the lessons of making parks in London and East London uh, over the last uh, decade. Past presidents are interesting. Sydney comes across very strongly as an ecological landscape. Uh, everyone, I think, uh, knows the achievements of Barcelona in investing in hard public realm as part of a city regeneration programme for their games. Uh, the Munich Park, a phenomenal uh, landscape integrated with the venues, the Otto Frey structures. Um, and then also Atlanta uh, with a, a tight urban site retrofitting a new public space, a new public park into uh, a very neglected part of the city and so there are ingredients for London that we could learn from all of those other uh, examples but I think for London the benefit was that they were able to take all of those examples and synthesize those lessons to shape the thinking for a contemporary park and the next generation. I think uh, we did also look at Athens uh, and Beijing but the ones I've mentioned I think are probably the most formative in Olympic Park maybe. 
Well, that's an interesting point. So at the heart of the, the, the vision which was set out in uh, the brief was really to create a new type of urban park for East London. And as we've talked about past presidents of Olympic parks elsewhere, London too has a international reputation for city parks. I mean, it's phenomenal. Um, with its wealth of royal parks particularly, but also its Victorian parks, like Victoria Park in East London, adjacent to the Olympic Park, gave a framework on which we could develop the thinking for a contemporary urban park, a new type of city park, which was very much a working, functional uh, park. Clearly one set to celebrate the Olympics, but one primarily which is uh, developed to establish a green infrastructure, a green framework for the regeneration uh, of East London. So uh, urban green space at the heart of that long-term programme and planning for the Olympics. Uh, I don't know, from, from your point of view, Annie, uh, as we were shaping up the brief and starting to shape the initial thinking, there were a lot of additional requirements that we wanted the park to do. Um, but being a working landscape and a new form of uh, city park was, was certainly central to the vision. I think the thing that um, was impressed upon me at my initial briefing meeting was the importance of the quality of design. And actually that was one of the most scary things for me because how, when you're trying to describe um, in a brief um, all the complexities of the relationships and what needs to go into the park and all the, the sort of requirements like security and health and safety, all, all these things um, that you might call administrative, if you like, very important. How do you, as well as all of those, drive through this really, really important message that design is at the fulcrum of this park and it's got to be... Um, and that was a really, really strong message that I got from John, who was my client, effectively. Um, and we sort of, uh, you know, we, we um, on a number of occasions, we sort of went round in circles about how are we going to get this message through. And in the end, we had a section in the brief on vision, which was maybe three or four paragraphs. And right at the bottom of that, we had a single sentence that just talked about how important... Um, the, the quality of the design was and what that should achieve and it talked about things like awe in nature and beauty and it used the brief used the word beauty and beautiful a couple of times and although that's more sort of common parlance now when you're talking about design back then actually people didn't use that word and so we were trying to think of ways to really drill home the importance of design. I think it's also the whole aspect of an integrated piece of landscape is important and integrated is sort of a heavily used word now. Um, but often say with the garden festivals it's about a park whereas this was very much about infrastructure, some stunning venues, obviously you know the stadium, the aquatics, the velo are important architectural elements but the brief had to establish the role of the park to integrate in not only staging the games and fulfill the functional requirements of the Olympics but also integrate with the transport infrastructure or the utilities, uh, the amelioration of the river corridor. Uh, so it wasn't a standalone project in park making in isolation. This was very much at the heart of changing a part of East London primarily for the games, but also for the long-term legacy. I think in some ways it was almost like there were the two visions in that regard, because there was the vision of this amazing backdrop for this amazing event, or series of events, but then there was also the future and the legacy and what it was going to mean to the, the surrounding communities, and so we had to think about both of those and we had to incorporate both of those in, in the brief um, in terms of the sort of future design progress and, and particularly the management as well because the management in the future will be a really important part and that was part of um, the thinking in the brief that was a separate section on, on the management plan. I think uh, we, we talk a lot about the vision uh, and the structure of the brief and we've got to bear in mind for uh, anyone who is charged with writing briefs that you can get a whole copy of the original brief for the Olympic Park as part of the learning legacy materials. So those are all the uh, uh, case studies uh, and briefing papers 
and some of the original documents available on the web through London 2012 Learning Legacy. Well, the first um, first step in the in the process really was a briefing from John Hopkins and Peter to me, um, and. I don't know whether I thought about this at the time, but thinking about it now, really my um, training as a landscape architect takes me through survey, analysis, design, implementation. And I was going through those processes as I was preparing the brief, but the end product was the brief and not something built on the ground. So um, the, the survey stage um, was very much about talking to people. So there was, you know, hundreds, thousands of people already working on the park um, and there was uh, master planners um, having got as far as what equated really to um, RIBA stage C. Um, so I needed to have conversations with them about the stage they got, particularly about the constraints, the site constraints which were quite um, significant um, and I needed to um, well, actually, I needed to learn a completely new language because Peter had already got up to speed on this and it was, you know, what is low cog and overlay and all this stuff. And, you know, you'd go to a meeting and I'd think, oh, I don't know what they're talking about. Um, so I had, it was a really quick learning curve for me. Um, but I think that was really important because I had to learn it so quickly and the people who were going to be tendering to the brief weren't necessarily going to have any more um, knowledge of the site or the um, organisational structures than I had, then that made it very important that the brief was very clear about all those those processes and sign-offs and, and such like. So that survey stage, rather than being a site survey, was um, talking to people and listening to people um, and going back to them and asking more questions. Um, and I guess, you know, one of my attributes is that I'm not scared about asking questions, so that was all right. And um, so then I had to sort of draw all this information together, some of it was, was in written form and um, there were a lot of uh, requirements in terms of the ODA's um, priority themes and so those, um, there was sustainability, um, health and safety, security, um, Legacy was another yeah. one. Access and inclusion. Access and inclusion. Design strategies. Yeah. It's a whole raft of different strategies. And, um, yeah. yeah. So, so the, these the, these were strands that um, had to be incorporated in in the brief, and the their importance had to be explained. Um, and the, at a, a slightly later stage, then all the um, representative individuals from the ODA of all those themes then commented on the brief. Um, well, the draft brief that I prepared and I'll tell you at one stage I had more pages in my comments than I did in my actual brief. Um, eventually I managed that to compile. The, the brief was over 100 pages <laughs> long so that's a lot of comments. <laughs> I think the brief was slightly shorter at that stage. At that point, um, yeah, it did get longer. Um, but I did sort of compile that down into a table and it was as, as part of the analysis really it was really important that that um, that all those comments that I'd had, I could tick off yes included or you know not included and give a reason why it wasn't included because there had to be an audit trail uh, in terms of um, comments because you know things like um, well take security for example they the security people weren't going to tell me precisely why certain things were important but you know they were important and they needed to be in the brief um, so so that was a sort of really interesting intellectual. Um, exercise really to, to go through that and I, I sort of um, reflect back to in one of my previous jobs um, I was um, a director of a large environmental management practice and um, my board one of my board responsibilities was risk management which meant that um, I had to work with all the staff in terms of training with regards to um, contracts that we entered into and I worked with an environmental lawyer on this and he would always start off all his lectures going scope 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 and that was the most important and I sort of remember that and um, it is really important to be very clear about what the scope is um, so if you get onto the so, the so that was the sort of analytical stage moving on to the design stage then just actually putting the brief together and working out what goes where and 
uh, Peter, John and I had discussions about, you know, this should be here or that, and, and we moved things around quite a lot. And it was very much driven by knowing that the people who were going to be reading it and responding to it in quite a short period of time for you know, the tender for the biggest landscape construction project in, in the UK, maybe in Europe, um, you know, they had to click very quickly as to you know, what it was all about. So we had stuff about the vision very early on and then we had things about what they needed to do very early on. And um, more about the sort of processes and sign-off procedures and, and such like were um, came at a much later stage within the brief. And there is a sort of diagram in the brief which shows the sign-off process and it's just loads and loads of boxes and arrows and everything and you know it's enough to make you go sort of slightly um, cross-eyed when you look at it. So that just trying to get over all of that um, complexity um, in, in the brief was, was one of the challenges. And then, um, you know, eventually delivering the, the brief um, and going through the various um, ODA um, sign-off procedures. I think there was, well, I, I noticed on the front of the version that's on the Legacy Learning um, website that the, there's eight versions, but I think probably there was lots of intermediary versions between those eight. And John signed it off eventually, and then it was used as, as part of the, um, the tender process. Yeah, I would say... There are a few important lessons that uh, certainly I've picked up in the process. One is the, the value of bringing uh, an external advisor or an enabler, in, in Annie's case, to really collect, as Annie has uh, explained, all the thinking around the project and almost to sit at arm's length and synthesise and structure that down because this was a complicated project. There were a lot of different things going on all at the same time, uh, you know, earthworks, site assembly, uh, some of the structural developments, certainly the bridges, a lot of the venues, they're all happening. So this wasn't like, we're going to write the brief and then we'll start the project. The project was full steam ahead. So to have someone separate, really focusing on the brief, its structure and sense, very important. The second, I think, for the brief, it is the one bit of paper that everyone signs up to, from chief executive to project team to consultant team, uh, all, all the way through, it is the focus on what you're spending money, and in this case a significant amount of public money, and what this place will look like in the future. And so it was very important that we got that bit of paper right. The paper extended to 100 pages in many ways, but it's the front end of that document that set the framework to develop the scheme uh, in, in many ways, but got buy-in from all these different stakeholders. But I think you're absolutely right about it being beneficial having somebody who um, wasn't involved in the project because um, what was difficult for me to understand was going to be difficult for um, other outsiders to understand and so that helped me um, sort of in terms of really working out what it was important to communicate and how best to, to communicate it. And I think you can also, because it is one of many briefs and in, part, in, in fact in many ways some of the early pre-bid briefs uh, and the master planning briefs preceded this so this was part of a, a briefing process but central to the detailed design development of the park and it was very useful to have someone who was separate to all of that but could think very clearly and, and, and synthesize the key points out of the other project uh, elements that were, that were going on and be able to set out very in a very clear structure what was needed for this specific part making commission. And I think it was really important, I would say this wouldn't I, I think it was really important that it was a landscape architect that was doing that and um, because I could understand um, quite clearly what a landscape architect could do in terms of the broad remit that they, they can play and um, I'd worked on some very large construction projects, park projects in Hong Kong and in fact John and I worked, John Hopkins and I worked together in Hong Kong on this so um, I think in Hong Kong the role of landscape architect is um, more often the lead consultant, in fact on the park projects we were always the lead consultants and this is what John wanted on this, that the landscape architect would lead the design team and so he and I were totally at one with regards to that and so that was very important in formulating um, the description of the roles in the brief.
Well, there's two parts to that question, really. There's um, the integrated team that um, was ultimately led by the Hargreaves LDA team, and then it, there's their relationship with all the other the consultants. So taking the Hargreaves LDA team first of all, um, the, the ODA was very clear in um, the way, this wasn't so much in the brief as in the sort of conditions of, of tender, um, that there was a requirement for um, the lead consultant not only to do the work um, themselves but to bring in um, a number of other practices and the, the OTA was quite prescriptive in, in terms of there needed to be practices that were based in East London so there was a local um, a connection, there needed to be um, some young up and coming practices, it, 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 these weren't necessarily landscape architectural practices but in terms of providing um, the, the sort of input to the whole team and think, also the... And I'm interrupting but I think specifically on that the project management expertise for the team, the planning management and also the arts uh, expertise came from East London. Uh, it did, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and then there was a requirement for international um, expertise because it was acknowledged that um, there were international practices that would um, have more Olympic experience than any of the UK-based practices. So that was um, the way that the, the ODA used the, um, the, the requirements in the tender process to set out um, some of the um, well, yeah, some of the requirements that it wanted in terms of the, the integrated team. And I, I suspect also um, the sort of disciplines that were also listed, like lighting, horticulture, those, those sort of um, additional disciplines that a landscape practice wouldn't necessarily have in-house. And I think this was also really important in terms of giving um, young practices, smaller practices, an opportunity because... One of the gripes that um, um, you know I can relate to, because I know that um, the Landscape Institute gets from some of the smaller practices, that it's very hard to get on onto procurement lists for large projects. And if you aren't on the list, then you never get the opportunity to have the experience. And um, I think this was a really good way of um, ensuring, from the ODA's point of view, that it had one point of contact in terms of liability and, and that sort of thing and it had the, um, the sort of weight of the project management skills that it needed. But it was also saying, but you've got to allow other people to have part of this cake as well. And I think that's something that could be re replicated um, in other big projects and should be replicated because, um, you know, sometimes you'll get a lot more sort of inspiration and wild ideas from someone who's straight out of college than someone who's been sort of ground down by the sort of systems and bureaucracy that we all have to live through. So that was the, the first side. And then the second side was about the relationships between um, LDA Hargreaves after they were appointed with um, all the other um, uh, well, all the other consultant teams that, that were already on board. So um, there was still a master planning role going on. Um, there was um, landscape engineers for North Park and landscape engineers for South Park. There were also all the other consultants that were appointed or being appointed to all the venues. So um, even when we were writing the brief, then Team Stadium was there and um, HED had been appointed as the landscape architects to, for, the, for the stadium. So um, in terms of the, the way that the ODA ensured that um, integration, if you like, we had a big section in the brief about all the working relations with all the different consultants. And there's a diagram in the brief which um, sort of shows how that worked with the, um, particularly with the venues. So you'd have... Um, what was called common domain and that was the area that was going to be part of the parklands and public realm project and then you'd have the the venue and you'd have front of house and back of house for the venue and so that relationship between the common domain and the front of house of the of a venue that was being designed by a different landscape architect was really really important and so we made a um we put a lot of emphasis in the brief about the relationships and connections that were necessary to make sure that when you um, walk into the park, you don't think, oh, that's the Hargreaves LDA bit and that's the somebody else bit. And, you know, you, you can see schemes, well, I know one in particular in Liverpool where you can see that line on the ground when 
different landscape architects have used different paving materials. So it was really important to have that integrated, holistic approach to the whole of the park. I think, I think early on, and again, lessons for this, was that uh, in writing the brief, one could see the direction uh, and the need for the range of skills so that those disciplines were set out in the brief, although that mix changed during the process. And so in the brief, it is, it's more than a shopping list, but it sets those skills but some of those skills were used a lot more in the design process than others. Uh, and uh, so one has to understand with that, that brief and the team structure, it has to be flexible. In the brief, it's not set in stone and that's fixed. It has to uh, uh, change and be amended. I think also uh, what is important in terms of continuity is that the design team, whilst they are a lot of individuals who come together and we've uh, all been involved in building multiple disciplinary teams that you get the chemistry working very quickly and so from a US practice LDA um, and Hargreaves from the uh, from the UK and the US side started working together as an integrated team with US and UK landscape architects almost from day one so that integrated process was about problem solving as a team uh, very early on in the design development mm -hmm. process. And interesting you make that point because um, when, when it came to the selection stage for the um, landscape architects, then I was representing Cape Space and the Landscape Institute and um, the, the Director General of the Landscape Institute um, gave me sort of three criteria, if you like, that I should be um, looking at in, in terms of the assessment from the Landscape Institute's point of view. And one of those was about team chemistry and... Um, um, demonstration that there was longevity in the relationship so de being able to demonstrate that if you hadn't worked together before that you were going to um, be able to maintain those relationships for the four years of, of the design period so it's interesting you pick that up because that was one of the um, bits of briefing if you like that I had from the Landscape Institute. I think then the other part of the question is also how do you deliver that integrated design process throughout uh, I think the simple answer is really strong, good pro project management, setting clear deadlines, sticking to them, and they had a very rigorous programme, uh, and certainly um, Adrian Rourke and Matt Heal, who were concentrating on the uh, programme, both landscape architects, but from the project management side, were able to intelligently understand the design process, but stick to programme, and regularly have uh, integrated design teams every week, every fortnight, between various uh, individuals, properly uh, structured, so that that uh, design development was properly being tied together, integrated, uh, on a weekly basis. Now that's uh, a good point. The, the design advisors uh, contributed to the process in a number of different ways. The ODA uh, recruited uh, during the development of uh, the venues and the infrastructure and, and the park uh, some full-time full -time design advisors because the ODA focused very heavily on the quality of design and knew that it couldn't just rely on the design brief. It had to be managed and overseen from the client's perspective. Uh, so uh, there were in-house design advisors and then the advantage um, from the relationship with CABE was that the ODA was able to access a range of uh, technical experts to help problem solve or inform and bring additional thinking to some of the design development. Uh, I'll give one example, uh, the work on the uh, wetlands and the river edges and river margins led by Atkins' uh, fantastic job Early in the design development, we were looking at how you could structure uh, that planting to work really well for games time as well, look great. Uh, and Jeremy Persglove, who was on the uh, enabling program, came in as a, a sort of technical design advisor to contribute to that, which uh, really just added some extra thinking at the right time in that uh, design development process. I think as the design moved on through the stages, that input was, was less, and uh, so uh, it was up front in the early thinking that was important. But there were, my understanding was that there were some um, absolute um, requirements for um, good design reviews to be um, achieved. So if, 
um, if a review didn't get a positive reaction from um, a design review panel, then the ODA had to, um, you know, make moves to, to change that or to change whatever the, the problem was. So design was being driven through the planning process as well. And um, you, you might sort of think that once the master plan had got planning permission, that was it. But that wasn't the case. That They had to keep going back for um, planning permissions at, at various stages for various different elements of the park. Yeah, the design review was inputting on the technical side. Design review, uh, CAVE established uh, with Design for London, uh, the GLA, uh, a joint design review panel chaired by Paul Finch, uh, and that looked at all uh, the aspects of, of the project, uh, built form, the infrastructure and the park. But what that design review process, and you'll, you'll know from contributing to other uh, design review uh, events, was that it brings the thinking together on a project at one point where the design team can stand up and actually set out what they are seeking to achieve in this design and then have that properly and robustly scrutinised by a broad panel. Now some of the input is incredibly helpful and some is uh, probably less helpful. But what it does do is it pauses a design process at fixed points to bring everything together, stick it up on the wall and then talk about it for half a day or half an afternoon and actually uh, capture what the, the key strengths and key weaknesses are of the design at that point so that it can be improved through the design process collaboratively. And it's always done very much as a, you know, a constructive conversation. It's not like a sort of college crit where you get loads of negative stuff thrown at you. So it, you try to, um, you know, from the panel's point of view, then um, you're always trying to enhance what is there already and um, have a conversation with the designers, not um, wind them up so they're feeling sort of defensive. Uh, yeah, I don't think it ever got to fighting, <coughs> but it might have, uh, might have got close to <laughs> On the procurement side, uh, I had uh, sort of input, partly through structuring um, uh, the design team, and uh, Annie then led on that in terms of design brief. Uh, but also through the construction uh, of the park, we spent quite a lot of time, particularly with Stuart Wilson and uh, uh, the project management team, Matt Hill, etc., looking at how you would structure the different work packages and how they would be delivered within the time frame available. So the procurement of the entire park uh, was one contractual exercise split into uh, primary tiers, top tier, secondary tier and, and, and third tier uh, contractors. Uh, and then the procurement of the uh, design um, was a, a parallel exercise set out very clearly within the design brief. And I think Peter was involved, in the, there was a sort of two-stage um, scoring mechanism, so uh, consultants had submitted large amounts of information and those were scored against certain criteria and Peter was involved in that stage um, and I wasn't involved at all. I think that was um, mainly um, ODA procurement and some other individuals and from that process they shortlisted three um, practices and they then came to um, this panel that I talked about earlier. So I felt very privileged to sit on that panel. Um, I was representing Cave Space and the Landscape Institute but it was chaired by Frost, who was head of um, design at the ODA. It had Ricky Burdett, who was the architecture and urbanism design advisor for the Olympics. Um, Peter Bishop. It's Peter Bishop, who mm. was um, chair of Design for London, and um, somebody from the Lee Valley Park, because it was really important in terms of the, the future legacy and concept. That, and there was also somebody from um, London Development Agency. So um, we, uh, they gave presentations and we went through, um, we, we had questions, but there were sort of um, strands of questions, if you like. It wasn't a very, very formal, this person um, only asks this question, which I've seen at other procurement processes. So there was a bit more, I think you had to have, because of the sort of personalities that, that were there, I don't think they would have, um, you know, done what they were told if they were just given a piece of paper with a question on to read out. So, um, you know, we, we tried to gain, like I said, with Design Review Panel, we tried to have conversations with the, um, uh, the, the people who were bidding for the work. And um, that was a very... Um,
but it was a very exciting process, if you like, and um, I, I think it was good for the landscape profession. You know, I was treated as a complete equal with all those other individuals, and um, we, you know, we went through the process of asking the questions, asking follow-up questions, and just trying to get a feel of not only the sort of design philosophies of those companies, but also of the people who were going to be doing the work, because that whole thing about how the, the chemistry of the teams was going to work, how they would um, interact with the clients and with the other consultants was a very important part of the, of the process. I think for the design brief, um, we've, we've, we've said a lot about its ingredients for success, um, that it is, I think, very useful to have that uh, responsibility for drafting the design brief led by one individual, perhaps not necessarily at arm's length, but having overall editorial control uh, and to be able to be um, commissioned to do that. Because often de design briefs are a sort of patchwork quilt with everyone chipping stuff in, but no one actually tying it together so that it flows and has, I think, in intellectual thought and vision that is structured. So having a single authorship to coordinate and edit that down, even though there will be many constituent parts, that's the first start. How about no, I would agree with that. And um, so that I, I've responded as a consultant to many design briefs when you sort of, you can just see that, you know, suddenly somebody found, oh yeah, well, let's just add that onto the brief. And so that sort of um, cohesiveness is is really important. Um, I think it was, on a project that scale, then it, it as I said earlier, it was quite important to have a landscape architect involved. And I think um, in terms of sort of, you know, your question is about going forward and lessons then, um, you know, at the moment we're seeing local authorities losing more and more of their landscape architects in-house, which means that they will be, um, when they need landscape architectural input, they'll be procuring from the, the private sector. And so how that works within the local authority and who writes the brief and who writes the assessment criteria is, is really important. And I think it's, it's important to think about that um, and not just sort of, delegate it to somebody. Um, I, I'll give you an example, I won't tell you where it is, but I know of a park strategy brief that was written by um, the lady who manages the theatres, you know, and that sort of thing, um, inevitably you get a, a poor quality brief, you get consultants who don't really know what they're supposed to be doing, and in the end you don't get a good product. So it, it's about really um, investing some resource in the actual process of writing the brief. And also I think in, in um, determining the assessment criteria because that's the other sort of part where um, you, you need to be working out what you want, who you want, what they're going to be doing before you can actually be assessing whether you've got the right um, people in the, in the consultancy that you're, um, you're considering appointing. I would uh, say, and everyone talks about the vision at the heart of the brief, and uh, that's very easy to just make sure that that's written, uh, but it really has to be properly articulated, and then also, I think, uh, brought in by uh, all those involved, from the chief executive to the project managers to the consultant team, so that it sets out that vision for change and it is clearly articulated up front in the brief, and I think that's one of the successes for the Olympic Park, whilst it is the delivery of many hands and great expert designers, the first four pages of the brief set out that vision, and they are echoed with the forward from the chief executive, and explains how this place will change and how it will look. So it has that sort of almost emotional and visionary element at the front end, which which can't be just written uh, as a technical exercise. You really have to feel that. It's a good word, emotional. It's good to, yeah. you know, so you have to get that sort of real um, desire and feeling into it. And um, quite a bit of my enabling for Cave Space was working with um, local authorities and, in some cases, consultants when they were doing um, green infrastructure strategies. and. We would always be saying, um, you know, the really important thing at the beginning is to get the stakeholders together and get the vision. And I, quite often that doesn't happen. So quite often this is the desire to sort of rush around and um, collect data and, you know, survey this. And 
Um, and really that sort of um, visionary bit at the beginning is just so important and I think that um, is important. And that's important even if it's a small brief for a small park or a small piece of public realm um, because you need to have uh, um, buy-in and, and you need to recognise if there's conflicts in terms of what the vision is and try and address those early on and not end up with the consultant having to do that and then have to redesign. Uh, we were lessons on procurement as well, oh, yeah. and uh, I would say on that side, uh, there is some clear practical elements. You've just got to have really good project management, and particularly from public investment, that it has to be a very robust uh, uh, process that can be uh, scrutinised from, from, from a whole range of different viewpoints. Uh, so clear programme and clear structure, and starting that process early, which is always the most <laughs> obvious lesson uh, uh, in, in addition to uh, involving landscape professionals in that process. I think the flexibility on procurement was important and certainly we described uh, procuring um, uh, a multi-disciplinary integrated design team which set those skills but for the design team then to develop and emphasize certain elements of those skills early on was important. So having that flexibility uh, through that procurement process was, was also key. And I think in terms of um, procuring the consultants, then this would be like a red rag to a bull to procurement people, but um, having some flexibility and um, being willing to um, accept that uh, there may be, you know, somebody who comes in who's potentially going to be your designer might actually have some better ideas than you've had in your brief and so being willing to, to be flexible and, and that did actually happen on the, um, the, the park. George Hargreaves um, challenged some of the thinking on some of the engineering aspects and um, that was very convincing to us on the, on the panel that um, they as a, a consortia had obviously really looked at the detail of what they had in the brief and they'd um, got information from elsewhere as well and they'd really thought about how that was going to work and you know we as a panel had to be brave enough to say actually these people have come up with something that is different from what we thought we were going to be um, commissioning for and actually we think it'll work better and so it's that and I think if you've got um, I don't want to if you've only got bureaucrats on, and if you've got um, more junior people on um, selection panels, then they won't have the confidence to do that. So I think it's really important who's, who's sitting on those panels and being very clear about what their role is in terms of decision making and what level of authority they have. Well, what I, I think uh, the brief set out to do and what the park has achieved is create a new type of urban park. Now I think this is an evolution uh, in, in many ways because we are starting to see uh, multifunctional working landscapes, post-industrial landscapes that uh, have developed uh, over the last decade or two decades. Uh, Latz's work in Emsha, for example, Hargreaves' work elsewhere um, are part of that evolution but the demand of the brief was to create a new type of urban park and I think for London 2012 has delivered that. I think uh, what it had also uh, achieved is to be able to move our expertise on, on restoring uh, very neglected, very heavily polluted uh, urban sites and to retrofit a landscape within the development process uh, in a very fast track but uh, sophisticated manner and by that I mean it is a landscape that has tackled a whole range of water management issues. It is a landscape that has delivered a whole load of biodiversity uh, benefits and dividends. It is a landscape that has explored contemporary horticulture in many different ways. The Olympics gave a platform really to try and push the thinking and the design development and the delivery of park making in lots of different ways so it's not just a great biodiversity park it is a great community park a great social venue uh, for hosting the games as we saw but also one that culturally is also very interesting because it embraces uh, 
much of the industrial form and reworks the industrial waterways to the south of the park in a way uh, that perhaps London hasn't done so much elsewhere. And I think if, you know, as a professional, if you want to read more about that, then go to the Green Infrastructure Case Study on the Learning Legacy um, site, because that really does explain all the different, different strands. Um, you asked about um, 50 years' time. Well, you know, I hope in 50 years' time that it's still um, a place that people, visitors to London, want to come to. So it's still a very special place for an international audience. But that equally, um, you know, there will have been all kinds of um, local interventions that have taken place through um, what local people want. And so, you know, it needs to be, um, or it needs to be all things to all people really, but it needs to be um, that local place that you can just go to and kick a football around or, you know, grow your vegetables or whatever. Um, but equally, it, it needs to have that wow factor for um, tourists to, to still come and, and look. You know, there's enough um, in terms of the architecture and the landform there that will um, continue through the, the decades to, to provide that interest. Um, but ongoing management and maintenance, you know, it won't come cheaply and there's got to be a real commitment to, to that um, from the, the, the legacy authority and, and the local authorities um, surrounding it. I mean, it will always be the Olympic Park, partly because it's the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, so it keeps that name. But I think it is uh, a place that uh, Londoners and the country will always remember back what a great summer, what a great sporting summer, but what a great national event uh, London 2012 was. Yeah, and also because it was in all the papers, you know, they were all talking about the park and the flowers, and that was, you know, that was fantastic, so... And so, so I think it will always have that. And actually, if you go around uh, other cities in the world, they've always got the, the Olympic Park and you go, go back. But I think it will capture that spirit and hopefully the park will develop. So what will it be like in 50 years? Well, it will still be the Olympic Park. But one hopes it will change and develop. It will be uh, always full of new thinking, new surprises, I think, which is important. And increasingly become a locally used and locally loved park as much as one that provided a national or international stage set for the games. And hopefully it'll still really, you know, be very, very important for biodiversity and, and um, all the sort of uh, ecological aspects for which it was designed. And I, I guess there'll be some kind of monitoring programme that will um, will follow that through. And that'll be a really important sort of scientific resource as well, looking at what was created and then, you know, how the habitats have changed and how the species have come in. and. And, you know, if that monitoring is um, quite detailed, then it may well be an important resource in terms of the impact of climate change as well. I think uh, transferring the lessons uh, is really important and uh, the Landscape Institute, it's a learning legacy partner, uh, has done an immense amount of work of sharing uh, much of the lessons and work across the membership and broader stakeholders through a wide programme uh, of events uh, up to and since uh, the, the, the Games in the summer. So lessons have been learnt and shared. There is uh, a learning legacy resource, which uh, Annie, you've, you've mentioned already, uh, but provides an immense uh, documentation uh, of the design process, the technical delivery process, not only of the park, there's some 25 papers, on the park, but also the broader uh, techniques for delivering sustainable development from waste management uh, to enhancing biodiversity to utilities and infrastructure. So the how you apply those lessons is to access a lot of that information. I think another way is, for those who've had the benefit to visit, is just look and see and learn and absorb in many ways just the structuring of a landscape and that contemporary landform approach, the use of planting, both ecological with the meadows uh, and the uh, wetland areas and wet woodlands, along with the horticultural plantings led uh, by Sarah Price. And I think to take those lessons uh, and understand the aesthetic of what the park stands for and take, take that into your design work is, is a further way.
I think it's also um, a really good example of where a landscape architect has led a very significant project and um, so that is a useful um, uh, useful sort of tool if you like to demonstrate what the profession can do so um, even if you're talking about smaller scale projects then um, if a client's sort of wavering about whether the landscape architect should lead or the engineer should lead then actually you can refer back to this and say well you know this was led by landscape uh, landscape architects um, so I think that's and I think um, you know there were so many small interventions that are applicable to any site um, they just happen to be on a massively big and very sort of um, I would agree. It's very easy to say, oh, well, that was the Olympics, you know, nothing to do with my uh, project uh, in this, you know, small district, small city or, or whatever. But the techniques uh, were all brought together into one envelope, the Olympic Park envelope. And those techniques for enhancing biodiversity, water management, the creation of swales and rain gardens, uh, the establishment over probably 18 months of urban... Uh, wet woodlands in a way that hasn't been done, I think, in urban contexts on that scale before. Uh, the challenges uh, and achievements of delivering meadows, both perennial meadows and wildflower meadows from Nigel Dunnett and James Hitchmo. All of those individual ingredients, and many are written up in the learning legacy, give you techniques to take into your own individual projects. So I think they are entirely reputable lessons. Many of them are actually more cost-effective ways of doing design, so it's not a budget issue. I think it is more of a technical and technical understanding issue of how you manage water, how you recycle and reuse waste, how you establish a, a, an ecology that is a synthesis of native uh, and exotics in many ways. I think those are the lessons that are entirely uh, re rep reproducible, better word, across many different projects. I think uh, early on in the process, ensuring that landscape and the role of the park was at the heart of the project. I think in many ways it was understood by the client from chief executive, chairman, uh, director of uh, design and re regeneration, but to ensure in that process that landscape wasn't the sort of final, uh, I hate to say icing on the cake, but a, a key piece of infrastructure, the foundation to that regeneration of East London uh, has always been a regular discussion uh, and had to, the case had to be stated again and again and again to lots of different audiences. I think one of the other challenges was really delivering on sustainable development. It's a very easy phrase uh, to use and it is part of all project making now. We're all involved in delivering sustainable projects but to set targets say the reuse uh, uh, and recycling of demolition waste of 90% and I think they hit a 98% target which is really, really a great achievement. To really rework the use of water and non-potable water in a more creative way so that the irrigation on the site uh, is part temporary, part permanent, a lot of water is recycled grey water rather than tap water should we say. The, the technical aspects of those, I think, are, are uh, particular challenges, but real achievements for the park as well. I think in terms of achievements for me, then, um, you know, it was, it was obviously um, a brief that was well received by the client, because um, not only did they invite me onto quite a prestigious panel to select the landscape architects, they then asked me to write another brief, and then you know, four or five years later, however long it was, they then um, asked if I'd be on the on the Learning Legacy steering group. So, you know, I just felt um, it's very different. I, I'm self-employed now and, and was then, and previously I've worked in very big um, organisations, and it's very different when you get a sort of, that sort of um, thank you and we want you to do some more, which is based on a thank you to you rather than to the company. So that was a real sort of... Um, you know, I felt very proud about that, so it was a real sense of personal achievement. Um, and in terms of what I've learned, then, um, 
just the sort of complexities of a big landscape construction project and um, how many things you've got to think about and uh, you know it was it was a few years since I'd worked on big construction projects before and this was bigger than any of the parks that I'd been involved in building in Hong Kong and um, the site was probably more complicated and more contaminated so all those issues and, and also the um, the end product um, had more sort of um, requirements in terms of the people it was needing to to please and serve so um, it was the sort of that's what I've learned about um, you know how complex it is but how you know when you've got processes in place and you've got the right sort of um, processes and um, criteria then actually you can go through that um, design process and deliver something on the ground which is fantastic I think, I think uh, for me personally on achievements um, I've been really grateful to be able to have been involved early on uh, as the ODA was um, being set up always in a part-time capacity always sort of having an advisory role from the beginning almost to the end I sort of finished just at the beginning of July um, and to be able to help shape some of the thinking, see the design development and contribute to that uh, in the early stages, but then also to capture the lessons. Uh, and uh, with John Hopkins now having put that into a book that tells the entire story from winning the bid through to constructing and hosting the games. And I, personally, that's a, a great achievement to be able to tell the story and be part of the narrative of many others who have contributed in incredibly committed and technical detail. So I think that's uh, an achievement. The, the, the biggest learning for me is that it demonstrates how the profession and how landscape can be at the heart of re-establishing and regenerating many neglected urban communities. Uh, the, uh, an urban landscape sometimes is an, uh, an add-on. Uh, an addition a nice to have. For the Olympic Park and into legacy it will be the central foundation of making that new city district in many ways. Whilst it will have many different components a fully integrated working landscape is what's been delivered through the work of many skilled individuals and very clear leadership from a, from a client is important. But I think also as we look to try and deliver the next generation of sustainable development thinking and also take the challenges of one planet living where we really try and uh, look at more efficient uses of resources. I've learned that the uh, Olympic Park provides a fantastic model on how to do it at this point of time. It's one step in the direction in many ways. I'm glad you gave yourself a plug for your book, yours and John's book. Because if you Absolutely. hadn't gone to, I was, I was going to do it. And so, when's it? When's it? When's the publication date? Uh, it is. Uh, I have just picked up a copy about an hour ago. Oh, fantastic! So, um, it is just. About so, can hours. we buy copies now? Uh, yep. Yep. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I think, in terms of showcasing the um, skills of the landscape profession, this series of films really sets out that range of expertise that landscape architects are involved in, from being a clear uh, leadership from a clear client, through strategic master planning from the work of Edor Acom with Tom Smith, the design work from Neil Mattinson, uh, all the way through to some of the technical uh, elements and the detailed elements, such as Sarah Price with the uh, garden design, uh, the meadows with um, James Hitchmo, uh, and even the soils uh, with Tim O'Hare gives you that perspective of the incredibly diverse skills that are required to make a landscape and make an urban landscape in many ways. Uh, I think also um, it illustrates how the profession is a key player in delivering sustainable development if we are going to green our cities in more robust and rigorous uh, uh, manner uh, we have to have a landscape lead in that process and so that the, the different disciplines are integrated from architecture to town planning to engineering but landscape is central to that because we have to work with our natural systems and natural processes in a more technically competent and contemporary manner. I think it's about leadership um, that, that that is the for me that's probably one of the strongest messages that 
landscape architects can lead these multi-million pound um, projects and um, that you know it's great to be part of a, of a profession that can do that and this shows that we can do it. I think in terms of delivering truly sustainable development the um, Olympic Park demonstrates how that has been done uh, with quite clear structure and rigour. It's very easy as we've said earlier to deliver sustainable projects, but are they truly sustainable? And I think the Olympic Park, through the establishment of strategies early on and the sustainable development strategy for the Olympic Park was very important, along with biodiversity strategy and the design strategy, uh, were key in guiding the uh, both the design process and the construction process, but that it has been uh, overseen independently the Commission for Sustainable London 2012 has independently scrutinised the project from a whole set of sustainability objectives. Uh, and we talk from a landscape perspective and from a park perspective, but that also is as important on skills development, training, bringing a whole range of uh, individuals out of long-term unemployment to full-time employment. It is about health and safety, it is about accessibility and all of those sustainability objectives have been packaged together by the ODA as an intelligent client delivered through the design and construction process but also scrutinized independently through the Commission and so you have clear analysis of sustainable how, how the park delivers sustainable development from a whole set of different perspectives and I think if you look at it in a very sort of simplistic way then economically you know, it's been a success and it's regenerated an area that would never have been regenerated um, otherwise. Um, from the social aspect, then um, you've engaged with the communities, you're bringing in new communities and this is a place that um, will be for the people for, forever. And, you know, quite often when you're talking about sustainable development, then that the sort of getting the balance of the, the three um, different areas is, is quite difficult um, and you might have sort of expected that the biodiversity would um, be given lesser importance on a scheme like this which was so important for people initially and where there was obviously very strong economic drivers but biodiversity um, was uh, has led some of the decision making in terms of the design process and biodiversity has been hugely important um, throughout and I think it may be in part that's because um, although the area was very derelict to, to start off with then there was some quite important ecology there because of the, um, the brownfield um, status of, of the, the land um, but I think it's you know you could really at a very high level you can demonstrate that those three elements of sustainability have been achieved and then, as Peter was saying, you know, as you as you sort of delve into all of those those um, areas in a in a more sort of detailed way, you'd be able to pluck out different examples of, of how they've been achieved. Yeah, I think we shouldn't overlook the one lab, one planet living principles as well. So that early in the bid uh, and through a setup of the the ODA towards a one planet twenty twelve uh, was a key document. And One Planet Living sets those uh, range of requirements to do with carbon, to do with waste, mm -hmm. to do with health and to do with biodiversity. And they set a central script that were tied into the strategy and design development throughout. But you can then drill down into the project. So for biodiversity, as we can read about and have heard about a lot, those objectives from One Planet Living were clearly delivered in a lot of technical detail and the Olympics demonstrates how to do that. I think for example also waste, a more efficient use and recycling of materials on site, the Olympics has been able to demonstrate that. So I think if we are looking to deliver more resource efficient development, the Olympics does provide a very well uh, recorded process of delivering those types of environment which are towards a one planet living even if we are still living beyond our capacity we are starting to work towards making that more 
resource efficient and more cost effective and you know what actually incredibly beautiful at the same time I think one of the uh, greatest achievements of the park in many ways is that it, it showcases what the profession offers, particularly for those who are interested in becoming landscape architects. In many ways we've emphasised the design role as a landscape architect, but I think we've also talked about that great diversity of skills that landscape architects have been involved in throughout the process. Very clear project management if you're interested in delivering things and having a technical structure. Jim, if you're interested in ecology, be it through preparing planting plans for wet, wet woodlands uh, or uh, grasslands is, is another approach. I think if you're looking at some of the construction techniques for soil management, uh, engineering, all of those different facets really illustrate what a broad-based profession it is for those who are considering becoming a landscape architect. And the other thing is there were actually um, there were two landscape engineers so Arabs and Atkins were appointed as landscape engineers and they had um, a role that is quite commonplace in Europe um, a landscape engineer but in in the UK we we would rarely use that term before and I think that's showing that the profession is um, embracing elements of other professions and, and working together. So I agree with what Peter said is it's um, if you got the impression that being a landscape architect was only about um, design then that isn't the case at all and I think that's um, demonstrable from, from many other projects but this one particularly shows that it shows the importance of the management, it shows um, how important planting design is and responding to things like um, biodiversity action targets and um, looking at the, the ecology in a very detailed way um, and, and so it's, it's about and, and just creating a sense of place so there's, there's a lot of areas where um, someone thinking about their career could see opportunities that weren't perhaps what they might have thought landscape architecture was. They'd be able to see those in um, what the park has created and how the park was constructed. Um, so I think it's a really good example to, um, to look at. As uh, a landscape architect, you're interfacing with so many other di disciplines as well. Yeah, so you've talked yeah. about engineering, talking about architecture, also town planning, also some of the community engagement aspects that it is not only working with those niche skills and understanding what's required to deliver robust, healthy, attractive landscapes, but also deliver that collectively with a whole range of other disciplines, other professional skills, but also a whole range of other stakeholders so that you are at the heart of the process. And I think that's a really attractive proposition for people who are interested in a design profession mm -hmm. uh, in the future. And if you looked at the brief, there's, um, there's a bit in the brief where it lists um, all the other um, skill areas that we anticipated would be required. And that would give, um, you know, it would give you an indication of the areas where that overlap exists. So lighting, signage, um, culture, art, all, all those um, areas that um, perhaps are on the periphery of landscape architecture, but you can see how they're a really important part of the, the whole um, design process when, when you're producing something um, like a, a big park.